Uh, well, thanks so much everyone for uh, coming to this talk. So um, I did see sort of at the last minute that sort of advertised title doesn't quite align with what I'll, I'll be talking about today. So uh, you'll have to forgive the, the change in topic. Um, so the, the project that we're working on with JClinic right now is um, on this topic of low data learning and sample efficiency, it's not quite ready. And so I'm gonna talk about some other related concepts and work that we do in the group. And um, we'll, we'll sort of see the themes of sample efficiency come up, but that's not going to be the focus of what we talk about. So I'm gonna go ahead and- Yeah, and, and, I answer, and, and sorry for this because, you know, I know you made the effort. Tommy Yakola was supposed to talk and we have you. I really appreciate the effort, uh, Connor. Thank you. So it's good. It's perfect to change the title and do your talk. No worries. Thank you. Of course, yes. Happy to be filling in here. Um, excellent. So I'm going to start off sort of with this broad motivation of drug discovery and specifically thinking about small molecule drug discovery. Um, it's a very long, complex, and expensive process, and many of us will have seen these kinds of pipelines showing the different stages of drug discovery and developments and how each stage can take years and, and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. This is very true. And we of course have high attrition rates in the clinic, um, even if we get a molecule into clinical trials. But what we're gonna focus on today is this sort of preclinical stage of the discovery process where we're thinking about taking some known protein target perhaps that we want to find a binder for, um, which will start sort of a, a campaign to then identify an optimized molecule with properties that are good enough to eventually become a preclinical candidate. And so we're in this sort of early stage of molecular design, where quite often we're going through these iterative design cycles. Okay, so a lot of molecular discovery and drug discovery is no exception, goes through this iterative design process. We're given some goal that we have in mind for the properties that we'd like some molecular structure to exhibit. We form beliefs or models about what structures exhibit which kinds of properties. We use those models or beliefs to form hypotheses of new molecular candidates that might exhibit a good set of properties and we need to validate those predictions. So for validation, we turn to the lab, right? we synthesize these new molecular entities, we assay them and we collect this new information. Now, usually what happens is we get some new information and we figure out that the molecule isn't quite as good as we thought it could be. And so we revise our beliefs and we keep iterating through this cycle. But eventually we might find a molecule that does check all of the boxes and we'll call that a discovery we might progress that to clinical trials. And so a lot of the work that we do in the group relates to using computation to accelerate discovery. And here computation is meant in the broadest sense. So this can include computational chemistry, cheminformatics, data science, machine learning, as well as laboratory automation. And the way that we're going to use computation to accelerate this discovery process is both with regards to generating and testing hypotheses again, just sort of mapping back from this sort of high level framework onto drug discovery, what that really means is trying to develop tools to make it easier and more reliable to design and synthesize new molecules. So the types of molecules that I'm talking about, if you're less familiar with sort of small organic uh, compounds, look like the ones on the slide here. So yes, drug discovery is the main context for our work. And so there's of course a wide range of small molecules used as medicines and antibiotics. But we also use small molecules in many, many other contexts. So we use them in agriculture, we use them in materials, uh, we use them in sort of energetic compounds as well. And so you know, for each of these applications, we're still probably gonna follow that iterative discovery cycle, even if right, what defines a good molecule changes, right? The definition is going to be dependent on the application, but the process of finding that molecule is relatively consistent. Now, if we're talking about sort of machine learning for molecular discovery and small molecule drug discovery, um, I wanna to touch on a few sort of preliminaries about machine learning for molecules. I'm talking about the ways that people usually think about screening to identify good compounds. That's gonna connect us to property prediction and ultimately to molecular generation in this first chapter of the talk. So one of the classical ways to find good molecular structures is to search within an enumerated space of possible candidates. And so this is sort of a classical virtual screening setting where we have this direct querying of some sort of property prediction. Okay, so we might define some chemical space that we're searching within. And uh, there are very, very large chemical spaces now that are defined. So we can go online and we can get a list of 20 billion compounds that we can purchase and hopefully get in about six weeks. 
And so one task might be finding which of these 20 billion compounds has the best property. And again, that property could be determined through an experiments or through a simulation, right? It might take a relatively large number of evaluations to find the best one within this space. Now, because experiments and simulations can be quite expensive, it's sort of very, very commonplace in computer aided molecular design to rely on these surrogate models, right? So surrogate models are going to try to replace or at least recapitulate the results of experiments or simulations. Now, if we're thinking about trying to map the molecular structures to the properties they might exhibit, one question we have to answer is, well, how do we actually do this representation, right? So how do we actually take a molecular structure and use that as inputs to some sort of machine learning pipeline? So of course, if you're familiar with these, you know, the basics of neural network models and many other regression techniques, we expect vector valued inputs and molecules are not vectors inherently. They're not inherently strings and they're not inherently images. They're a different type of data structure. And so the sort of predominant approach for a long time was this sort of notion of feature engineering where you took a molecular structure and you would represent it in terms of these fixed numerical properties. And you'd say, well, index one is my molecular weight, index two is the lipophilicity and so on. But the trend sort of increasingly in about since 2015 has been to sort of use the fact that neural networks are very, very good at representation learning. And so if we provide them access to the full chemical structure, whatever that means, and we'll get to that in a second, it might be able to learn the relevant features of that structure that is required to then regress to some property at the end. Again, so a classical case here would be, we have a list of molecules and we have a list of solubilities, let's say, and we're trying to learn the mapping from structure to solubility. So the way that we represent molecules in a way that's compatible for these types of machine learning approaches really depends on the type of information we're trying to capture. So in some applications, it might be sufficient just to capture sort of the one-dimensional structure identity of that compound, and we'll use a very simple one-hot encoding. Quite often, we want to understand the molecular structure and topology, right, and how atoms are connected. And so if we have this sort of two-dimensional information or, or two and a half dimensional, if we include stereochemistry, we can choose a number of representations from fingerprints to graphs. We can render images of molecules, even though it's not a great approach. We can still use expert descriptors and we can use smile strings to represent molecules as sequences. And each of these different representations is compatible with different types of machine learning architectures. Now, in other cases, we're gonna be working with properties of molecules that are really properties of a three-dimensional conformation of that molecule. So this would be like an energy or a set of forces over the atoms. That's going to be sensitive to the precise 3D positioning of atoms in a molecule. And so we might use three-dimensional representations these sorts of atomistic networks to capture that aspect of molecular structure. In much of what we do for drug discovery, we think about using graphs, right? So graphs sort of are this nice intermediate representation where we don't sort of have a rigid three-dimensional conformer, but we have enough information about how atoms are connected through bonds and what that structure looks like. And this graph structured data is very compatible with graph neural networks and message passing neural networks, which is a very popular class of techniques these days. So just be explicit about the role that these surrogate models take, right? There's sort of two main ways that we can use them to speed up the evaluation of new molecules. If we think about training machine learning surrogates on experimental data, again, where we have tables of molecules and their properties, the goal is to re recapitulate the output of an experiment. And it's very common to do this on properties like uh, bioactivity, different sorts of ADME properties. And the point of doing this is so that we can generalize the prediction to molecules where we don't have data. And again, bioactivity is not something that we can simulate with first principles physics-based models. And so we want to use our data, experimental data, to generalize to these new structures. There's also a, a very large body of work though, fitting these surrogate models to simulated data. And if it's simulated data, then we already know how to calculate right, the ground truth measurements. So this could be the result of computational chemistry simulations or molecular dynamics calculations. 
And so the role of using surrogate models here is not necessarily to generalize to new structures or to be more accurate, but it's really just to reduce cost. Right? And if you sort of apply these surrogate models to things like density functional theory, you can recapitulate the same accuracy with orders of magnitude, lower cost. And so it just lets you simulate more systems or larger systems than the original simulations. Now, one type of simulated data that we've applied this notion of surrogate modeling to is the result of structure-based screens. Okay, so there's a technique called docking that's widely used in structure-based drug design to provide a very coarse estimate of the affinity between a candidate small molecule ligands and a protein of interest. And so what we'll do is we'll dock that compound into the protein and we'll try to estimate the intermolecular interactions and what that energy might be. And classically what you do with that kind of simulation is you go to the virtual screening approach and you'd say, I have a list of hundreds of millions of structures potentially. You dock every single one of them. And then you look at the results and you try to identify the ones that had the best performance. And those are ones that you might follow up on later with higher fidelity simulations or experiments. Now, what we showed um, last year or a couple of years ago is that instead of doing this exhaustive screening, it's really quite straightforward to get massive savings in computational cost by inserting a machine learning surrogate model. And so what we do in this workflow is instead of the exhaustive screening, we first screen a subset of the molecules. So we simulate, so we dock a small fraction of the molecular structures from our pool of candidates. We fit a surrogate model. We predict then the docking score, right, the, the performance of the remaining molecules that have not yet been evaluated. And then we select the best ones. And we go through this iterative cycle, each time selecting a small fraction of the library for evaluation. So docking is cheap, but it's not as cheap as these trained surrogate machine learning models. What this lets us do then is apply this sort of model accelerated virtual screening approach to these large, large spaces. And we can actually find, in this case, 90% of the top molecules. So 90% of the best 50,000 molecules by running 40 times fewer simulations than exhaustive screening would have taken. And so here we're just looking at the performance as a function of how many simulations we've run using different surrogate models inside this loop. And so I guess you see slight performance differences where message passing networks come out on top. Um, but the point is that regardless of what model you choose, you still see this massive benefit right, in performance by using a surrogate to tell you where to look instead of doing exhaustive screening. But of course, this is still looking at hundreds of thousands or even millions of simulations to find the right answer. And so there's room, uh, sort of room to, to work here and driving that number even further down. Now, even though there's a variety of surrogate models that work quite well and, and this approach is relatively robust, I do want to say that um, molecular representation learning is not solved by any means, right? There are many, many graph neural networks out there. There are a ton of different flavors. New ones are published all the time, but they still have a couple of, of pretty substantial flaws. So one is that if we're talking about the low data limits, the accuracy of these kinds of models is quite unpredictable. So you often don't really see a reason to use graph neural networks or message passing networks if you have fewer than, you know, let's say a thousand training data points. The other main limitation, which is much more fundamental, I would say, is that graph neural networks naively don't consider stereochemistry. So stereochemistry is a property of molecular structures where two compounds can have identical graph connectivity. So it's the same atoms connected to the same bonds, but they differ in the relative orientation around these sort of tetrahedral centers. So in this case, in these two structures, right, the dash line is going into the plane and the wedge, uh, solid dash, solid wedge is coming out of the plane. These two are mirror images of each other that are not superimposable. So these two structures would have different properties when interacting with proteins in the body, let's say, but a graph neural network would not be able to tell the difference between them. And so we've done some work recently trying to identify right, what's the right way to represent and encode these structures that actually respects the fact that two molecules can have the same graph but different properties as a result of their um, stereochemical configuration. 
and they sort of bottom schematic here. And this is a figure by Kier, who's in the audience. Um, we're sort of showing that different types of networks, even special ones designed to have uh, you know, physical equivariance properties like these SE3 networks um, aren't actually that good at representing these structures because when you have different conformations of the same structure, they don't actually respect the fact that that's the same molecule, right? So they, they can't really understand the difference between an antimers versus different conformations. And so there's a lot of room still to improve these techniques. Now, if we go back to uh, this sort of view of, of how we're going to find molecules from our virtual chemical spaces, we've just talked about sort of one set of work thinking about virtual screening. That's this direct approach. If there's a direct approach, there's probably an indirect approach, or in this case, an inverse approach. And so this is a, a class of techniques uh, known as inverse design or generative modeling that's becoming very, very popular in drug discovery. Because these inverse models in theory are going to take this structure property relationship model and invert it. When I say invert, I really just mean it's going to help generate the identity of a compound which it believes maximizes a property of interest. And so these generative models, you know, search in an in infinite, at least unbounded chemical space compared to these, you know, fixed virtual libraries. They've been around for decades, starting with genetic algorithms in the 90s. Um, the modern trend for these types of models is to use deep learning. And so deep generative models often employ things like variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks and reinforcement learning, right? different strategies to learn distributions over molecular space and propose new compounds. And so these have been generating a lot of excitement, like I said, and, and one of the sort of early case studies to get a lot of press was the study at the end of 2019 led by in silico medicine where they showed that it took them just a few weeks to come up with uh, what they described as novel nanomolar hits against this particular kinase ddr1 and so their pipeline they started with known kinase structures and kinase inhibitors right, information about the target they were after they used a generative model to learn that space and to propose 30,000 structures now, from those 30,000 structures from the deep learning model, they then used traditional cheminformatics techniques, property prediction, clustering, heuristics, to filter them down to 40. They looked at the list of 40, and they picked six that they thought they could synthesize. They tested those six, and one or two ended up being good, and they published this nice paper. And so while this could be seen as a success for generative modeling and drug discovery, it could also be seen as sort of a failure of some sorts because we have 30,000 structures coming from the model originally. And at the end of the day, six are tested. And this is partially because the types of structures these models generate might not be easy to synthesize. If we actually look around at different generative models and the types of structures they propose, unless we've told them anything about synthesizability or even stability, they can come up with structures that are quite unrealistic. And so on the slide, I'm showing a few sort of really bad offenders where these are compounds proposed by generative models that you know, claim state-of-the-art performance at the time of publication. They score very well on these in silico benchmarks trying to optimize heuristic oracle functions, but right, their structures are not reasonable whatsoever. Right? So if you've taken an organic chemistry class, you should hopefully recognize that this structure on the left just doesn't make sense. This one in the middle doesn't make any sense and would be absurdly unstable, right, if it existed. The one on the right does make sense, but it's very synthetically um, inaccessible. So it's hard to imagine trying to synthesize this exact structure. Now, not all examples are this egregious. So there's a few cases at the bottom where there's sort of subtle aspect of the structure that makes them hard to synthesize. And so it's sort of these subtler cases that can cause a lot of headaches because synthesizability, it turns out, is not easy to assess. So if we're looking at two structures side by side, they could look really similar, but they could be very different in terms of how hard they are to make. Okay, so here we're looking at two structures, ribavirin and some other compound that's not ribavirin. They differ only in the position right, of the substituent. Ribavirin is really easy to make based on the natural selectivity right, of this sort of ribose uh, sort of core. This other one on the right 
takes many, many more steps. It's not actually commercially available. And so again, despite having really similar graph structures, similar functional groups, similar oriented layouts, um, they're actually quite different in how hard they are to make. And this brings us to the next chapter of the talk where we're going to be thinking about chemistry now. Because in a drug discovery campaign, we're proposing hundreds or thousands of different molecules. And we're asking medicinal chemists to synthesize hundreds or thousands of different molecules. And each one of them might require a different synthetic routes or a different idea for how to produce it. And it's really tedious to go through them manually and plan those routes, but that's what's, what's commonly done. And so in this sort of field now of predictive chemistry, our goals are really to facilitate the synthesis of new molecules. And again, we're gonna target the sort of generative models and, and think about, well, how do we take the structures they propose and learn how to make those molecules if we can even make them in the first place. And so this is a task that you could also call synthesis planning and synthesis planning has been around for a very long time. There were computational approaches to synthesis planning uh, since the fifties. And so what we're trying to do here is come up with computational tools to help us go from a product structure that we can use as inputs to everything else you see on the slide. Okay. So what we're really after here is a recipe. We're trying to figure out what starting materials to use as our basic ingredients, our building blocks, what conditions to use, or how to combine them, what intermediates we expect to form. We might have to purify or isolate those intermediates and chain together those steps to get to our final target. Now, humans are taught to do this process. Uh, when we take organic chemistry classes, we learn about retrosynthetic analysis, which is this notion of starting from your product and making simplifying disconnections to work your way backwards. We can train algorithms to do the same thing, it turns out, and we can do that even in a data-driven method. So because chemists have been doing reactions for a very long time, we have a lot of information out there in the literature and in patents. And commercial publishers have gone through a whole lot of efforts to tabulate this kind of information in databases. So here, this is an example from the Reaxis database, which is sold by Elsevier. What we can see is that the information they contain sort of describes the basic properties of a chemical transformation. So we, we know something about synthetic chemistry by looking at the reported reactants, what product structure was formed, what conditions were used at the level of, you know, what reagents or catalysts or solvents, how long was the reaction, what temperature was it, and what the yield was, right? So how successful was that, that transformation? And so we have millions of these labeled examples, right? And each one gives us some piece of information about chemical reactivity that we're going to try to learn from in order to plan the synthesis of new compounds. There's a whole lot of information about chemical reactions that we don't have, right? And if this were a mostly chemistry audience, I'd spend a lot of time complaining about the fact that we don't have this information. But I just suffice to say, there's a lot of details about reactivity that um, are not able to be uh, predicted because they're not in these databases. And I'll revisit that limitation later. So we're gonna press ahead with the information that we do have in these tabulated databases shown at the bottom. And talk about retrosynthetic planning now. One of the major classes of approaches to sort of proposing synthetic steps makes use of what are known as reaction templates. So reaction templates are these subgraph patterns that define transformations between reactants and products or products and reactants. They define in a very, very crude way the rules of chemistry. So we look in our database, we see what transformation was done we can heuristically sort of identify what atoms actually changed in their connectivity. And we can learn a general pattern from this specific example. So we extract out this subgraph that says, anytime I see sort of this pattern, this motif, this transepoxide, perhaps one way to synthesize this, if this appears in my product, is to use a reactant molecule with the transalkene, right? This other motif. And so we can apply this kind of thinking to the billions of reactions in our database so we can come up with this library of templates and rules. And as Marvin Segler nicely showed, we can then train a neural network classifier to take a product structure as input and then tell us what rule to use. 
So if I see this molecule, my neural network is telling me, why don't you try a Suzuki coupling to produce it? And so their proposed disconnection corresponds to the reverse of that Suzuki coupling. So this is sort of like a hybrid um, approach where we're using sort of chemistry rules. We're not using sort of machine learning other than this classifier. Right? On the left, this extraction of these rules is entirely heuristic, just uses cheminformatics techniques that have been around for a while. But there are many, many approaches to this task, many of which uh, are deep learning based and they sort of work end to end instead of going through this intermediate symbolic step. And so one architecture that we've put out recently is called graph to smiles. So what we do in this architecture is uh, sort of, it'll seem very simple for those of you who are familiar with the transformer architecture or other translation tasks. We take a product molecule as input. We represent it as a molecular graph and we use a graph encoder to perceive aspects of that molecular structure, right? Look at what functional groups are present, what atoms are connected and how. And after we do that graph encoding step, we use a transformer decoder on the other end to generate a smile string of the reactant molecules. And a smile string is just a sequential sort of text-based representation for these structures. So end to end, all we're doing is taking in a product molecule and we're outputting reactant molecules. And that's the task of retrosynthesis. We're going back, and we're proposing sort of a one-step disconnection for this product. And this kind of architecture can be trained directly on published data. Again, our database has examples of reactants and products. And so we simply mask the reactants, give them all of the products and try to have it recapitulate the reactants that were published for this transformation. And so with either of these approaches, right, going from products to reactants, we now have a way of doing one step retrosynthesis. If we can do one step, we can apply these models recursively to generate multiple steps. And so we can use different search algorithms to sort of deal with the, the explosion of, of possibilities such that we can map from a relatively complex molecular structure as our target back to pretty simple starting materials that are easily purchased quite cheap. Okay, and this is a particular example from now a couple of years ago, it's getting out of date, where in about one minute, the model came up with a 13 step synthetic pathway. And so, there's no guarantee whatsoever about the quality of this pathway, right? If it's the best or cheapest or shortest, but it's simply a pathway that our set of models believes is consistent with the literature that a campus can then review. And so we can have a different sorts of pathway ranking metrics and we can sort of prioritize sort of many different recommendations, uh, but at the end of the day, a chemist is going to look at this and decide whether it's good or not. And that's sort of the stage where, where we're at. If you do show it to a chemist, decide whether it's good, it turns out that it is. Okay, so um, there have been a couple of blinded studies where the recommendations from these types of programs are shown to a panel of chemists. The chemists are asked to choose or rank their preference between the model recommended pathway and a pathway that was actually published and verified experimentally in the literature. And so again, this was blinded, so the chemist didn't know which was which. And these are two different preference diagrams showing that there's no statistically significant difference in the preference for the literature, the true pathways, and the model proposed pathways. So on the left, this is using a data-driven program. This was again, Marvin Segler. And on the right, this is using an expert program with expert encoded rules from Bartosz Zhabowski. And in, in both cases, chemists could not tell the difference. And so that means that these models are operating right at a pretty high level and they can propose synthetic routes that are uh, again, to expert medicinal chemists and expert synthetic chemists, plausible. So since these tools do seem to work, right, we're gonna revisit the limitation that we introduced in the first chapter. We're gonna go back to this issue of molecular design where we said a lot of the structures that our deep learning models come up with or our genetic algorithms come up with don't look quite right. And again, some of these work by making sort of atom level and bond level modifications to structures. And so they're making these replacements which are syntactically valid and to the computer look fine. 
but uh, don't make any sense experimentally or synthetically. So if we simply take a list of compounds from these kinds of models, again, these are compounds that are you know, dreamed up through some uh, generative process. They've never been reported. They're not known. There's no known synthesis to them. We can simply run them through our model and see, is there a simple synthetic pathway that we can use to access them? And so in this case, yes, we can find what look to be plausible synthetic pathways for each of these six structures. And so these would pass our filter. Yeah. So if our model comes up with many different designs, we can use our retrosynthetic planning program, which answers this question of, well, how do I actually make this molecule to prioritize and filter and rank them? And so this works, but it doesn't always work because some of our models, it turns out, propose structures that are actually all bad. So if we apply this as a filter, right, and we use a synthesizability filter, it could be the case that none of the compounds actually make it through. And so that motivates us to work in a different sort of class of algorithms for molecular design, where we're revisiting the generative process. And what we're gonna do is we're going to build up molecules not atom by atom or fragment by fragment, but we're gonna build them up building block by building block, reaction by reaction. And so in this workflow, we have sort of an agent that's going to learn to select commercially available building blocks and select reaction templates and stitch them together into a synthetic tree. We can mask the decisions at each step to make sure that they're all compatible. At the end of the process, we have a synthetic tree which we can then just simulate using normal cheminformatics tools to generate the product molecule that corresponds to that tree. This whole process, right, all these selection steps can be conditioned on some embedding, right, to some conditional code. We can train this model then to take a target molecule as input and generate a synthetic tree that can be used to make that target molecule. It's okay, so sort of a forward synthesis planning process. Now, because we have this sort of conditional code as input, there's two things we can do with this model, or at least two things we can do with this model. Four, and we can use it as input, and we can try to generate a tree that defines a synthetic route to that compound. So we can actually solve synthesis planning with this model. But more interestingly, I think we can optimize the molecular structure through the conditional code. So if we sort of jump back for a second, there's nothing that says this, this embedding has to be uh, sort of something that corresponds to a true molecule that we know. And so what we can do is we can apply a genetic algorithm to modify or right, iteratively change this conditional code, generate the tree, look at the properties of the product that's formed, and then continue and keep revising this conditional code. So through rounds of this sort of genetic uh, algorithms optimization, we can try to maximize some desirable property of this product molecule. And if we do that, what we see is that the types of structures the model tends to propose are actually extraordinarily simple compared to ones that other models propose, but we also achieve high scores. And so here, and again, because we force our model to think about molecules in terms of their synthetic routes and how to make them, it has to have a synthetic route associated with each prediction. Whereas these other models on the right are building things up atom by atom or fragment by fragment. And so you end up with these large structures, which would be horrible to try to synthesize. And in this you know, particular optimization task, you know, we're just looking at a sort of heuristic uh, property called GSK3 beta. It's, it's a proxy for bioactivity. And we find that the model gets a score that's pretty good, right, compared to these other models with the extreme benefit of being synthesizable. And so if you're a synthetic chemist, this is really, really important because that means that these generative models are now making recommendations that are actionable. You can take the recommendation and you can go to the lab almost immediately, as opposed to these other models where you need to have an extensive filtering pipeline. So as with many things that we do in, in computer-aided drug discovery, 
um, there are parallels between these techniques and things that have, people have been doing for decades. Okay, so this idea of forward synthesis and learning how to do forward synthesis connects back to the notion of make on demand libraries. So these are sort of libraries where you can combinatorially uh, combine different starting materials and different reaction rules to enumerate all the possible products that you could make. And this is indeed how the sort of virtual chemical space of 20 billion was proposed that I mentioned towards the beginning of the talk. Now the role of the machine learning model in this case is to keep this enumeration implicit. So we don't have to list 20 billion structures. We can instead just teach the model what building blocks are accessible, what reactions are possible, and it will then know the chemical space it can explore and it'll only explore the space it needs to. And so it's sort of much more efficient compared to that brute force enumeration. Now, in this last brief chapter of the talk, I wanna sort of follow along this thread of these ideas and these recommendations being actionable because that's a really important aspect of the research that we're trying to do. We want this design of new molecules to be very intimately connected to the physical synthesis and testing of those molecules. Because again, we want to go through these iterative design cycles as fast and efficiently as possible. And so there's been a lot of parallel work in sort of automated synthetic chemistry, trying to use robotics and liquid handling techniques to run chemical reactions without human intervention. And so if we're now designing molecules that we know we can synthesize, it's very tempting to say, well, now can we just automatically make them in the lab? And the answer is sort of, but not really. Right. So again, ideally, we would go directly from this algorithmic design to the robotic system. But what we sort of achieved so far in synthesis planning is not actually enough. So there's a ton of decisions you have to make when you're actually running a physical experiment. And the first consideration might be what conditions to use to the catalyst, solvents, reagents, and temperature. We do have a model to help address that. The next is maybe what concentrations of those species should be used and what reaction time should be used. And we have models starting to address that as well. But there's still questions like what flask to use. Do you need to prepare it by putting it in an oven or sort of vacuuming out all the air? Is there a special order of addition that's required for the synthesis? Do you have to add a certain reagent slowly or quickly? All of these can actually change the outcomes of chemical reactions. They can be the difference between making the product you want and not observing the product that you want at all. If we're making molecules that take multiple synthetic steps, we have this sort of question of purification. We can't just keep adding things to the same flask over and over again in most cases. We have to think about how do we isolate that intermediate product and then use it in the next synthetic step. And so all of these, specifically the three bottom considerations, are our, our tasks and our challenges where we do not have models. And so this, this is sort of a, a symptom or really the reason behind a dirty secret of lab automation, which is that automated laboratories are not really automated. They've automated the execution of processes. And so they can automatically move vessels around, they can move liquid around, they can heat, they can stir. But what they don't do is automatically plan the process. Okay, and this is a pretty big gap, right? In this sort of vision of an automated autonomous laboratory discovering new drugs without, without humans, we can't go from the idea to the execution because we still have this really critical step of filling in the details. Um, and that's something that we're of course working on, um, but is, is perhaps a criticism of the general field of automated chemistry to be aware of. Okay, it's hugely beneficial to automate the execution of these reactions, but that is not that is not the whole problem we're facing. Now, even if we did solve it, which is a big if, and we're you know, several years, I think, from that stage, we wouldn't actually have all of the pieces that we need for truly closed loop design make test cycles. And that's because experiments, even if we know how to run them and we can run them automatically, can be time consuming and they can be expensive. And so if you're a medicinal chemist working on a drug discovery campaign, you might test a thousand molecules, 2000 molecules over the course of that campaign. 
So starting from an initial hit, which maybe has okay biological activity, but it's a little toxic or it's not soluble enough, it could take you, you know, low thousands of experiments to find a molecule that does have good enough properties to send into animal studies. Now, some sort of modern techniques are trying to reduce that down to low hundreds of molecules, but this is, this is sort of the order of magnitude of, of the number of experiments that need to be run. So if we go back to our generative models, right, which again are, are trying to solve this design aspect by proposing new molecular structures that are optimized for the properties we want, they're not quite operating at the same order of magnitude in terms of, of that sample efficiency. So most studies don't even bother to evaluate this. They just report the performance of the top candidate they find. But if you actually go back and you look at how many sort of Oracle calls were used during the optimizations, how many iterations it went through, what we see is that it takes often tens or hundreds of thousands of these Oracle calls to find the optimal molecule. And this is even on these sort of cheap in silico benchmarks where these are relatively straightforward functions heuristic models or, or, or machine learning models. And so if you're optimizing an experimental property, which is more complex and has a greater degree of noise, you'd expect even more Oracle calls would be required. And so there's this disconnect, right? Between what these generative models are doing to propose new molecular structures and what medicinal chemists know how to do. So humans, of course, we approach scientific problems with a really strong prior medicinal chemists have a very efficient optimization in a relative sense. And so they're able to do these sort of global versus local optimizations where they know sort of how, uh, how to tweak the molecular structures in subtle ways if they're only trying to run a few experiments. But they'll be very selective about what to change and what to change it to when they're thinking about modifying a molecule. And generative models right now uh, don't really think um, in those terms. And this part of this is our or is our focus actually with our ongoing work um, under a seed grant from J Clinic. Now I'll, I'll briefly mention uh, one model um, that uh, does try to do this sort of local optimization um, and that's the differentiable scaffolding tree. And so this is a, a model that's trying to allow us to take gradient steps with respect to molecular structure. And so, you know, because molecules are these discrete objects, you can't normally take gradient steps. You can't sort of take the derivative of a property with respect to structure. But in this generalization of a molecular graph, we sort of think about adjacency matrices and connections and nodes as continuous objects. So we can train a, a property predictor to map the sort of scaffolding tree representation of this molecule to the property we want. We can use gradient ascent to actually optimize this sort of continuous differentiable version of an adjacency matrix, weight matrix and a node identity matrix. We can then sample a particular graph from this uh, matrix or vector and we get a new molecule that should be incrementally better. And so we can sort of turn this into a full optimization pipeline and find that the sort of DST approach um, in this sort of lower limit of, you know, fewer than 50,000 experiments, which is still quite a lot, um, we see that it, it you know, reaches a high score earlier than these other techniques. You know, everyone ends up finding a pretty good molecule if you let them run for hundreds of thousands, but if we restrict the number of calls, we find this kind of strategy does appear promising uh, to let us, let us arrive at a good molecule faster. Now, just to sort of zoom back out, and wrap up, um, we've sort of been looking at this, this framework for molecular discovery and I've shown you a few different cycles. It's, it's all the same idea, just displayed in different ways. Where really we're working on algorithms to design new molecular structures that we believe will optimize some property, whether that design comes from a virtual chemical space that's been enumerated or whether it's coming from these deep generative models in a more flexible fashion. Because we need to actually physically test the molecules eventually, we're trying to couple this very closely to synthesis, right? And trying to design molecules that we know how to make, and then that also developing tools to learn how to make them and how to translate that into robotic procedures. 
And of course, we also work on the property prediction models that are used to inform the design. And so computation has a role to play in all of these aspects and really the whole pipeline of molecular design in this iterative optimization process. And so with that, I'll close and just thank, uh, thank very excellent research group I get to work with every day. Thank everyone else who's had their hands in this work over the years. Uh, point you to a few review articles if you're interested in this space and thank uh, both J Clinic and then uh, the Machine Learning for Pharmaceutical Discovery and Synthesis Consortium um, for generous funding of our work. I'll be very glad to have some discussion and answer any questions.